Wichita Liberty TV, featuring host Bob Weeks. Local politics without the spin. Interviews with nationally respected economists. Hear directly from Kansas conservatives about what matters to you. It's individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. Wichita Liberty TV. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, that's channel 26.1, Sunday mornings at 8.30, repeated again in the afternoon at 4.30. You can also find Wichita Liberty TV at my site, that's the Voice for Liberty on the internet at wichitaliberty.org. You'll find all the old episodes of Wichita Liberty TV there, along with show notes about each episode, and then all the other material that I and others produce on an almost daily basis at the Voice for Liberty, wichitaliberty.org. Well, today our guest is John Todd. He's retired from a career in business, first in sales, then in real estate sales and development. He's actively involved in civic affairs, perhaps most prominently as vice president of the Wichita Pachyderm Club, in charge of producing all the wonderful programs the club has each and every week. And just recently, the Wichita Club was honored by the National Pachyderm Club as the country's most outstanding club. So, John Todd, welcome to Wichita Liberty TV. Carl Peter John, our co-host, and one of the reasons why I wanted to have John on this week is because of his activism in Wichita and some Wichita topics we have that need discussing. For example, a couple weeks ago, us three, on my invitation, Friday afternoon, we went to Nasker Park for a little while. Now, if you don't know, Nasker Park is at Douglas and St. Francis on the southeast corner, I think of it is, but it's a little park there that... Uh, has been there for about 40 years, I think, of it, and uh, it has kind of a shady reputation, uh, doesn't it? But did we have any problem when we were there on the, that Friday afternoon? No, yeah, well, it was quite pleasant, but when you mentioned shady, there are a lot of trees there. Well, that's right. But I was thinking <laughs> of its reputation as, as a home for the <coughs> homeless, and there are quite a few homeless people in that park at... Uh, at uh, almost all hours. So the city has a vision, as they often do. First of all, they re-rigged the definition of tax increments financing so that $1.5 million would become available, and they want to transform Nasker Park from the tree-lined or the t shady, as you mentioned, Carl, um, a little nice cozy park with a <coughs> pond in it to it's something that I think in at least a photo that the city has uh, shown is like a flat plain covered by AstroTurf. You know, one of the things that uh, impressed me was kind of like a small oasis in, in a sea of buildings. It really was. Downtown. It's almost like you weren't downtown, except if you looked over, there's the Eaton Hotel, or the, you can hear the traffic on Douglas and so forth, but otherwise very pleasant. Everyone loves water, and it had a pond, mm -hmm. it had running water. Mm -hmm. or, you know, little waterfall. Little waterfalls. And trees. It was a very pleasant place to be. But something's changed. There's a company called TGC Development. They purchased the old spaghetti warehouse or spaghetti works building, which is a uh, multi-story building just right catty corner from NASCAR Park. And, um, well, here's what the city of Wichita said in a request for a proposal. It is the intent of the city with TGC Development Corp. as the project administrator to engage a quality design firm to create an elegant world-class design for NASCAR Park. The existing park will be removed and replaced. The city and TGC are seeking an innovative urban design solution which will enable users to actively inter interact with the surrounding redevelopment. So here we have a company that bought a building right there, just abutting almost NASCAR Park, and now they're going to have $1.5 million of city money to transform the park into their dream. It's an interesting situation because you've got a park that has a history. It's got lots of trees, which um, the visions I've seen would basically remove those trees. And uh, Two trees along the street, but other than that, a astroturf plain. But really. basically, it would uh, uh, it would basically uh, sort of our anti Arbor Day uh, vision. Yeah, I think so. It strikes me they want to fill in the pond. Yeah. They want to stop the running water. Oh, remove all that. Get all rid, the trees. Get rid of all the trees. 
All, all of the things that make it a... What about the gazebo? I'm sure that would be gone. Gone. Benches? And gone. All gone. And we're going to concrete... Walking paths? We're going to concrete over, but, but the nice thing, we're going to have nice astroturf. Nice astroturf yeah. there. And, uh, you know, here's what the internal planning exercise performed in con coordination with the Wichita Downtown Development Corporation. It was determined that the best use of this site would be a transformation that would function as a premium urban space. I kind of, it was a very nice urban space the way it is right now, I think. Well, there's certainly a lot of talk about continuing to have park facilities. The question that, that comes up is, is this going to really amplify the uh, uh, downtown area taken as a whole? And we've been through this uh, in, in the 30 plus years I've lived in this community. I, I don't know how many times I've been through here and it's sort of deja vu all over again, to quote that sage, Yogi Berra. Yeah, well, I've got some more information about what exactly they think they might do with that, but we're gonna talk about that after we take our first commercial break from Wichita Liberty TV. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks along with co-host Carl Peter John and our guest this week, John Todd. So again, talking about Nafsker Park in downtown Wichita at Douglas and St. Francis. Um, the city says they want to use this park for, in conjunction with major downtown events. Now what they're talking about mostly are the events at Interest Bank Arena, which is uh, really just a one or two hundred yards away from Nasker mm -hmm. Park. They um, I think that before and after concerts they can have events there in the park like, I don't know, I mean, what type of events are they talking about? And by the way, there aren't that many events at Interest Bank Arena. There are some months in the summer when there are zero events at Interest mm -hmm. Bank Arena. Well, I was going to think of events the city has held which would be separate from the arena. Uh, the Chili Cook-Off downtown mm -hmm. is held off and on Douglas and mm -hmm. right along there, uh, just west of the railroad tracks. Of course, that area is always going to be a bit of a challenge because it, it's a very active rail line that's immediately to the east of the park and you'll hear the trains coming by sometimes mm -hmm. as frequently as every 15 to 20 minutes. Yep. Of course, people I think that would want to move there or whatever are uh, perhaps aware of that. But, um, you know, the other thing is, and Chase Billingham, uh, he's a sociology professor at Wichita <coughs> State, has written about Nasker Park several times in um, uh, op-eds for the Wichita Eagle, and he notes that, okay, Maybe it's a good thing that the city is interested in Nasker Park, but what's the real motivation here? Well, we've talked about the private property owner who wants to maybe use city money mm -hmm. to fix up a park in their front yard, but also next March at Interest Bank Arena, we're hosting the National Basketball Association tournament, early rounds there, and they specifically in the timeline say this work has to be done by that time so that Wichita can show itself off a little bit better with, well as we've talked about, an asphalt or a astroturf covered plain where a beautiful park once was. Well, the challenge I see is we have a usually hot summers, cold winters, mm -hmm. often very windy. The trees serve as a mitigating factor if there are, there are few evergreens, although most are there to confess or not, but certainly they provide shade during the summertime and uh, and that's cooling as opposed to, I mean with AstroTurf you take a hundred degree temperature and the surface of that AstroTurf it can easily exceed, it gets, think, it gets yeah. uh, having been up at um, baseball fields where they've used it, it gets even uh, much, much hotter. There is a kind of a presence downtown for this type of facility, and that's the Ambassador Hotel. Mm -hmm. I believe the park department spent in the range of $900,000 to build a nice park next to the Ambassador Hotel. And the hotel, not, I've, I've never seen anyone except the hotel use it. They use it for guests coming in, checking in. Oh, it's the smoking annex for the Ambassador Hotel is oh, what it is. Yeah, well. Anyway, the, the use there uh, would parallel, I think, what they're going to do here. This was actually financed through public funding mm -hmm. and, and the most of the use. Of the, so here we have TSG, 
they're going to develop this, they're going to be looking at their own interests, basically. Exactly. And so. And in the request for quotation that the city sent out, you know, which is an invitation for people to say, mm -hmm. I want to bid on this. You know where you didn't send the bids to City Hall, you sent them to the offices of TGC. Right. Isn't right. that interesting? Suspect, in my opinion. No, oh, absolutely suspect. You know. And a lot of events at Interest Bank in the arena are in the wintertime. And I just looked at the annual report today. By far the most common event is a Wichita Thunder hockey game, mm -hmm. which is in the winter at mm -hmm. night. <laughs> I think that afterwards people are going to be very interested in January to go do something in Nasker Park after a hockey game. I suppose the if they bring in artificial snow, they could be, a, you know. There, there we could have some skiing or well, something. Certainly, yeah, absolutely. Or ice skating. Or I don't know. Uh, but it, it would have to be cross-country skiing because it's, yeah. I, I think what the vision is flat. Uh, it's pretty not flat, yeah. Not, uh, not even a hillside <laughs> type of hill. So, yeah, so, uh, and by the way, I mean, uh, talking about Interest Bank Arena, you remember, Carter, you were on the county commission, not when the county voted to have the tax for it, but you were on the county commission when all the planning and everything was going on. We were sold that that Interest Bank Arena would be an economic driver for the region. Right. And <coughs> if you look at the region surrounding Interest Bank Arena, especially to the west and the south, it's almost a desert of economic development, mm -hmm. save for a Kansas Department of Corrections facilities. And then over a little bit to the east, there's Commerce Street, where there's kind of a budding artist colony. Mm -hmm. But they think that now their property taxes are too high, and they want some sort of relief from that. Well, the challenge, uh, the facilities you mentioned uh, just southwest of the arena, they were there before the arena was built. But, but when we had the vote way back in 2004, uh, the, the you're absolutely correct that marketing the arena was it was going to be a driver for economic development, and the critics at that time, and I was one of them, you know, pointed out that this would be an aberration because it's been tried elsewhere and it really hasn't provided a major significant economic stimulus w across the country where they've tried it, and it certainly hasn't provided one here. But it's and of course now they want to use that same argument for. Uh, using public money to build a new baseball stadium, saying it's going to be an economic driver, and that really hasn't happened with the arena. Well, it's, you have the challenge because we can we have to determine whether, from a baseball field, whether we're dealing with a polo grounds or Ebbets Field that w were torn down, or Crosley Field, just to mention three former Major League Baseball baseball parks that were there that aren't now, or is it a Wrigley Field or a Fenway Park that you want to preserve, and that's that's we really need public discussion on that, Bob. Yeah, and I don't think the city council's that interested in that. Well, Carl, hold on to that idea. We're going to take another moment off from Wichita Liberty TV. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks, Carl Peter John, our co-host, and our guest uh, this week is John Todd. So here we have the city wanting to use one and a half million dollars of public tax money at the same time that, John, you noted that they're closing down some neighborhood mm -hmm. swimming pools. Right. And uh, what's the problem with that? Well, you know, uh, it, it, as I see it, it's a quality of life issue for neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want do you want the money siphoned off and, and into in the private developers' pockets downtown for their benefit, or do you want to see the funds used to enhance parks, uh, continue with the swimming pools, uh, things like uh, street repairs, mm -hmm. things that impact neighborhoods? And we have a city council election coming up, and and I, I hear the candidates making these issues. Yeah, yes. some of them do, and I think especially the McAdam Park, which serves the uh, northeast area of Wichita. Some right. people are really upset about that park. Uh, not the park being closed, but the pool being uh, closed. It's my experience uh, that the, the folks really don't understand how the, how the, the d dynamics of the TIFs and the public funding type things that are siphoned off for the developers work, but they don't like it. Mm -hmm. It really does create, in my opinion, a class warfare 
and I don't think that's healthy for our community. And you know, they are complicated issues. If the city were to simply give a cash grant to the people uh, that own the property nearby Nasker Park of one and a half million dollars, people would be outraged at that. But when they simply kind of divert money that would normally go to the city, county, state, and school district into the pockets of those developers, it's something that's more difficult to understand. There's all sorts of justifications that uh, they can come up with it, and it's really the same net effect. I think that if the public really understood that that part of that 1.5 million is actually being taken away from future school funding, mm -hmm. I think they'd be outraged. Exactly, and you know, in the city of Wichita, I think, um, uh, well, by far the biggest tax consumer is the Wichita Public right. Schools, um, bigger than the city of Wichita, bigger than Sedgwick County, almost as big as the city and the county uh, put together. But all of this might be a little bit different if it actually worked, because I looked, the United States Census Bureau gathers statistics about uh, business activity on a zip code basis, and the downtown Wichita is kind of neatly encapsulated in zip code 67202. It's from Kellogg up to Central, from the river to uh, Washington, roughly, so to speak, and you know what, the Downtown Development Corporation says in the past decade there's been a lot of investment in downtown Wichita, and there has. About $600 million in private investment and about $400 million in public investment, about half of that in the interest bank arena, but another $200 million in various uh, types of things. So a lot of investment, but the Census Bureau reports that since uh, 2008 or 2009, the number of business firms, the number of jobs, and the amount of payroll being paid to people working in that zip code has declined year after mm -hmm. year, and in some cases substantially. So we have all this investment, but it's really not producing the economic benefit that we were told it would. Well, that's unfortunately been part of the history, and having a separation with the public funds that have gone in, you mentioned a little over $200 million that was the total cost for the downtown arena, but that's a small portion compared to all the other spending that's occurred within mm -hmm. that zip code area. However, there are problems with the zip code usage because some of that number counts, um, if you're talking about the number of people employed in that zip code area, a lot of people, the administrative headquarters may be there, but the people are working elsewhere, and that's particularly true of the school district, Bob. Yeah. So you've got, to, you've got to be very careful when you're looking at these numbers. And that's an, another issue I want to talk about in our next segment, but uh, the numbers that I brought up were, I, we should couch, I should couch them a little bit, they were private sector workers only in that series of data. So there are public sector workers uh, that uh, are not counted there, but really not that many. I mean, there's the people working in City Hall, there's maybe a couple hundred working for the school district downtown, but other than that, it's mostly, I think, uh, a private sector workers. So. We have all this investment, but it's really not producing the benefits we were told. Well, that's one of the problems because with the private sector, you've got to produce or you restructure or shut down. Mm -hmm. In the government sector, uh, generally, you just raise taxes like the state has just done and kick the can down the road, and hopefully you'll get by till um, you have another fiscal crisis in the future. And that's one of the big problems we face, I think, in terms of downtown, because uh, government is such a big part of that footprint. Yeah, it is. And uh, a lot of government facilities there, but also a lot of government intervention and driving, such as the proposed transformation of NASCAR Park, which, of course, you know, the park is owned by government, but, you know, here we have the city wanting to plan what the future of that park will be when a lot of people don't think there's much problem with it with, uh, with the right now. With benefits accruing to the developer. Exactly right, yeah. So, uh, what's the song goes? We pave paradise and put up a parking lot covered in astroturf is what we're going to do right. here. But, but Almost that. But don't remember George or 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 Orwell's famous animal farm quote of all animals are equal but some are more equal yeah. than yeah. others and when it comes to <laughs> getting City Hall's uh, <laughs> checkbook out. I think we know who some of those are. Well, let's take our last commercial break here on Wichita Liberty TV. We'll be right back.
Well, welcome back to this last segment of Wichita Liberty TV for this week. Our guest this week, John Todd, co-host Carl Peterjohn. And Carl, in the, uh, before the break, you brought up about uh, problems counting the number of workers downtown. Now, what the city says, and actually there's a little bit of refinement there, but all over you see 26,000 daytime workers in downtown Wichita. And sure enough, there's census data. It's a series of data called LODES, L-O-D-E-S, that says 26,000, well, it's 25,800, around to 26,000 workers in downtown Wichita. But you nailed it there, Carl. There is one block in downtown Wichita from 1st to 2nd Street and from Main West to Wichita, I think it is, that has 7,000 workers working there. Yet that block is mostly covered with parking lots, surface parking lots. But the, one of the buildings that there is the administrative headquarters for USD 259, the Wichita Public School District. And the way this census data is gathered and constructed is that for multi-site locations like Wichita Public Schools, they've got schools all over the city, but all of the workers are counted as working there at that administrative headquarters at First and uh, Water, I, I believe it is. So, 7,000 people there, even though how many people probably work in that building? Maybe a couple hundred or, or something like that. But according to this census data, 7,000. And there's another spot in Wichita that has 3,000 workers in downtown in one block. That's Wichita City Hall. Well, yeah, there's a lot of people that work there, but many are scattered all out through the, through the, the country. And you know what? The Census Bureau specifically warns against this, that especially with state and local governments. It's common that all employees are reported as working in one place even though they're scattered out throughout the city. So how many people do work in downtown? Well that other data I talked about earlier was about 13,500. Now that does not include government workers but you know how many are there? There's not you know, thousands and thousands, there's maybe a thousand or something like that. So we have this problem where someone says there's 20, 26,000 workers. It's kind of true, but it's not really true in the way that they mean it to be. Leaves us with a real challenge going forward. And, and whether we're talking about employment or we're talking about the number of folks, uh, how much money is being spent by branches of government, or let's talk about housing a little bit in terms of properties that uh, are in the private sector or homes or buildings that are residences mm -hmm. that are in the public sector. Yeah. Now, whose fault is this? John, you've got something in your hand there you might show to the camera, but uh, I asked whose fault is this for the 26,000, and the answer was from Jeff Fleur, who is the president of the Downtown Development Corporation, now also president of the Greater Wichita Foundation, which is the main agency mm -hmm. in charge of our economic development. There's their annual report there, right there. And he said, well, Wichita State provided us this data. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the Center for Economic Development for, and Business Research at Wichita State provided this, the WDDC with that data, but they really wouldn't take responsibility for it. The director of that said, well, s whoever found that data, they no longer work here. But this data is cited in a footnote to all the reports that WDDC puts out. If you look at the data, you immediately realize at the Census Bureau, if you look at their resource, that this isn't right. So I wonder who bears responsibility here? For really a charade, I think. Well, it's, it's the problem with the collective because if it's not owned by anyone, who actually really manages it or controls it uh, in terms of looking at the details? And we can kind of pass the buck around here. Yeah. And of course, that's the old Harry Truman line where the buck stops here, or more recently, the buck went this way. Well, this, this is a well, one. I'm not pointing at you, John. No. <laughs> this is a one year report, and it's, it's very glowing on the number of jobs that uh, were announced as a result of downtown work. It, it, uh, it'll be real interesting to see what happens when the, when the school district moves from their downtown location to Southeast High School. That's, which is in a different zip code. So that one series of data that says 7,000 in downtown, it's going to all of a sudden say 7,000 in 672, 18 so or whatever. All, all of the arrows in this that point up 
Yes, I wonder if it's going to go down like this. They're going to be cratering, I think, right, like that. Right. You know, you were you were right, exactly right, Carl. The Downtown Development Corporation says Wichita State gave us these numbers. You know, the city of Wichita says the Downtown Development people right. gave us this number. And who really has ownership for all of this? You know, this is kind of an argument in favor of a strong mayor because, you know, the city council people s oftentimes, w they've told us this, that, well, we're just like the board of directors. Bob Layton, the city manager, he's the CEO. And all the time the manager says, we're asking the council for direction. But, I mean, who really takes ownership for this? Well, it's a real question whether the city manager is the chief executive officer, always more like a, and I hate to get too management here, a chief operating officer, mm -hmm. because he can be hired or fired. He's the only person who reports to the city council, unlike, say, the county commission, which is structured quite a bit differently. Take too much time to go into here. But if there's no person who's accountable, uh, you know, what gets measured and managed will be handled. And what doesn't, just kind of, we, we're like a, a corked bottle floating in the ocean. And as we've seen right here, there are some severe problems with the way we've been measuring the activity in downtown. John, did you have a thought before we run out of time? Uh, well, all, of, all the city manager has to have is four votes to maintain his position. Yeah. And, and you know, you're, you're bringing up an interesting thing. Uh, maybe there is a case to uh, change to a strong mayor and let the mayor have a veto power. Because we get to vote for so the mayor once in a while. We don't right. get to vote on the city manager. That's and right. you know, some people say, well, the strong mayor led to things like in Chicago, the daily regime and New York and Kansas City and things like that. But you know, at least somebody is accountable and we know who that accountable person is. Well, that's why you have six council members that, that offset the mayor's power, yeah. in my opinion. And really in Wichita, the only real power the mayor has is he chairs the meetings and he signs documents, but he can, uh, you know, if you look at uh, most ordinances, the city council says that authorize the mayor to sign. So uh, he really can't sign those things. And Carl, you were in that position as chair of the county commission. It's too. a public relations yes. role. It's kind of a bully pulpit to a certain extent with, yeah. with limited power. And he makes more too. He makes more money. At the city level, that, that's a key, that's an exactly important factor. Right. Well, guys, we are out of time. We're over time for this week. So, uh, Car Carl, thank you very much. And our special guest, John Todd, hope to have you thank back you. again soon. Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV. Hope to see you again next week. <laughs>